thank you for that uh, very, uh, very nice introduction. And it's, uh, it, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here. I do have a busy schedule, but I wouldn't miss it uh, for the world because I think here was one of the, the very first talks that I gave when I was a, a PhD student, and uh, it was a meeting organized by Sir Richard Southwood uh, more than a few years ago. But it's great to be here again, and um, I'm going to try and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the global challenges that we have in, in food production, particularly sustainable food production. And we're not short of those challenges. Um, there are some quite frightening uh, sort of statistics, if you like to, to call them that, uh, around at the moment. And uh, this is a particularly striking statement. We will need to produce more food in the next 40 years than in the previous 10,000 combined. And the difficulty we have in, 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 in doing that is that the, the, the drivers are difficult to address. There's increasing consumption, and particularly of meat, and that's driving increasing demand. So we're trying to deal with that demand at the same time as we're having uh, issues uh, around climate and the impacts of climate change on agriculture. Um, now, it's quite a challenge to address that, apart from the scale of the, of the increase in production and the fact that we've got to do that in the face of, of climate change. The other issue we have is that there's a limit to how many more resources we can pour into agriculture. So agriculture at the moment is using 70% of the world's fresh water supplies, occupying about a third of the land area and the other thing to bear in mind is that it's not just that climate change impacts on our ability to grow food. Um, actually, agriculture impacts on climate change by being the source of a significant uh, uh, amount of greenhouse gas emissions, as well as responsible for about 80% of deforestation. So what we need to do is we have these twin challenges of the need to produce more food, but actually try and mitigate some of the already quite severe environmental impacts of agriculture. And all these things kind of come together in a kind of perfect storm, as, as John Beddington, the government's former chief scientist, described it, of, of, of sort of cat catastrophic possibilities. So here's an example from, from a recent support, a report by the Royal Society that a one-metre sea level rise could flood 17% of Bangladesh, and that's going to not only displace a lot of people, but reduce rice farming land by up to 50%. So we have these, um, these sort of issues that are all sort of coming together in a rather tricky scenario. Uh, and Ban Ki-moon sort of summed this up rather well by saying, now more than ever, we need to connect the dots between climate, poverty, energy, food, and water we're increasingly realizing that we can't address those issues in, in isolation. In fact, the government's just uh, uh, announced a, um, uh, quite a large investment in a, in a data center uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a research program around what they call the nexus of energy, food, environment, and water. And one of my, one of my other jobs is, is to be a, 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 a a joint investigator on that program to try and synthesize the data around these complex issues and identify policy uh, solutions. Uh, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But challenges are what I like, and uh, it's what I do with my sort of day job as director of, of YESI. Um, York Environmental Sustainability Institute's a bit of a mouthful, so YESI is our, is our sort of abbreviation. And we recognize that these conf uh, this sort of uh, context of, of interacting issues is going to require an interdisciplinary and in innovative approach to solve. We can't address these issues uh, just working in our own usual departmental and, and disciplinary silos. So in YESI, we bring people together from physical scientists to, to, to measure soil properties to natural scientists to look at crop growth right through to social scientists because as someone once said, and to my shame, I can't remember who, but every, every environmental problem has human behavior at its root. So we need to work with social scientists and understand how to uh, change the way we do things. 
So I want to focus on a few of the key issues, and I do actually want to try and identify some solutions, because it's probably been a little bit gloomy so far, but we've got all these challenges. Is there anything we can actually do? And, and, uh, and there is. So I want to take one particular uh, problem at the moment, um, uh, and that is that we've become increasingly reliant on, on only a few kinds of plants. We don't have a particularly varied diet. Now, it might strike you as surprising when you go to a supermarket and see sort of rafts of every kind of fruit and veg and all sorts of things. But really, 80% of the world's food is provided by just 12 plants. And in fact, half the world's food is provided by three, wheat, maize, and rice. And it's kind of a little bit worse than that because we don't actually eat many varieties of, of, those, of, of those particular plants. So cultivated... Um, Asian rice, Ariza sativa, that's the primary food source for 50% of the world's population. But we only actually cultivate two of the potential 23 species, and this main variety, uh, this so-called elite variety, uh, Ariza sativa japonica, we've, we've bred that to such an extent that we've selected for so many different traits and we've done all sorts of things to it that it's actually ended up with about 10,000 fewer genes than its wild relative Ariza rufi pogon. So we've thrown a lot of babies out with the, the bathwater, I think. So one of the ideas is that, is that we've actually lost some key traits, some key resilience in, a, in our crops. And a recent, uh, a recent program funded by, by the UK government and the Department for International Development and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is to try and increase uh, crop production in a more sustainable way by identifying innovative approaches to improving the resilience of crops to things like drought and insect, uh, insect attack. And our project at York, although it also involves collaborators in the US and in India, and what we're trying to do is crossbreed uh, some of those genes we've lost back in. So uh, this is one of our elite, elite cultivars. You sort of recognize this, and this is nice grain that you make your nice rice from. And this is, is Rufi Pogon, which is, is, is a little bit more like a, a, a tree, really, than a rice plant. And Susan McCooch, our collaborator in Cornell, has taken some of uh, the genes just by natural crossing. This is not a genetically modified approach. This is natural uh, crossbreeding. And, and she's been able to generate rice lines, a large number of them. <coughs> so they're all down here. And these are the chromosomes across the top here. And what she's got is so-called chromosome segment substituted lines. And what they mean is that each line has a chunk of chromosome from the wild parent crossed into it. And the idea behind that is that we hope when we transfer those chunks, we've transferred some interesting traits, some traits that help the elite rice become more like its wild relative in terms of having traits like increased root length, so it's more resilient to drought, and increased uh, pest resistance. But we also hope, because we want to the best of all worlds, is that, it, that this cro these cross lines will maintain the high yield of the elite cultivars. So that's the hope, and then we're going to trial which of these lines we think will be good with our collaborators at the Central Rice Research Institute in India and try and identify ones that are going to be suitable for future crop production. So that's the plan. How are we getting on? Well, the first thing we've done is test responses to drought in the labs at York uh, and look for traits associated with drought tolerance. So one of those traits is, for example, an increase in root length and root weight when the plants are droughted. So here is one of the, uh, the wild types. Karinga, that doesn't do very much. Here's one of the lines. That doesn't do very much either. But line number four is showing a lot of promise because after seven days of drought, it has increased its root length. So that's uh, uh, quite, a, a, quite a significant development. But what we need to do, of course, is check that this happens in the field. So we've been growing all these lines out in the field and looking at the way that they yield under different conditions. So this one, uh, 
Can you see that very well? But it says number of tillage. So, so this one is, quite, uh, is, is a high-yielding uh, line. So then the idea is that we look and see which chromosome segments this particular high-performing line has got uh, included. And it's those segments that we should be identifying for future crossbreeding. So the idea is to identify these traits in the lab and in the field, link these beneficial traits to particular segments of the genome that we've, that we've transferred. And we're quite lucky because the rice genome has been sequenced. There's a lot of genetic data, so we know what some of these segments do. And then we can, we've got markers that tell us when we've been able to cross those segments into elite cultivars for improved varieties, which we can then try in the field. So uh, we've done this bit, and we've done most of this bit, uh, and we're now hoping to start this bit. And we've got another two years to go, so uh, it's kind of early days, but we're making some progress. But this is a YESI project, so it's interdisciplinary by nature. So we're not just looking at the crop biology and the crop physiology. We're interested to see where these rice varieties will be most useful. So we have some crop modelers and some climate models involved in the program. And we're focusing on India, as, um, and particularly uh, this area of India in the northeast of India. But India is quite an interesting case, because you think of paddy fields and everything. But actually, 18% of, uh, of the rice growing areas in India are very drought prone. And almost half of them are rain-fed agriculture. So in other words, this is small subsistence farmers who wait for the monsoon to start. It starts raining, they plant their rice, and they need it to keep raining. So the rice constantly has enough uh, water. They have no irrigation, and they're just hoping for the best, basically. But increasingly, the monsoon has become more unpredictable, uh, and it's arriving later, and uh, there are also an increasing number of what's called break days. So these are days once the rain has started and the rice has been planted, and instead of raining every day like it's supposed to, there's a gap. And you might think, well, a gap doesn't really matter very much, but actually, the rice plants, particularly when they're, when they're at two stages, when they're either very young or when they're about to flower and so start to yield grain, they don't like break days very much. Um, and what we've shown in, in our data is that if we look back at ma and map, the historical rice yields against the historical rainfall information, what we can see is that each additional break day reduces yield on average by nine kilos a hectare. Now, that's a lot if you're a, a subsistence rice farmer. Now, that's looking back and seeing if we can pull out the importance of developing more drought-resistant varieties for production in India, but we can also look forward and say, what is Indian rice production going to look like in the future? And this is the current observed uh, area of rain-fed rice cultivation. You can see why we're focusing in the northeast here. And this is using the um, projected climate models from the IPCC and looking forward and saying, which of these areas will still be suitable for rain-fed rice growing in 2050? And the answer is not very many of them. Anything in orange will no longer be suitable. So the climate models suggest that this form of agriculture is going to be hard to sustain if climate models are right and if we don't actually do anything. Now, the other issue that's really important, of course, is to look at farmer uptake. We can come up with all sorts of interesting new varieties, but if the farmers don't want to grow them, we're wasting our time. So we've got a social science component uh, led by the Indian uh, part of the team looking at what influences the type of crops that farmers want to grow. So we had a very interesting visit uh, um, a couple, uh, about 18 months ago. And we listened to what the men wanted, and that was better yields and lots of pest resistance and all sorts of things. And then um, the sort of cultural sensitivities here. So apparently speaking to the women farmers was much harder. But uh, apparently the only person in the team who could actually do that was, uh, was me, because I'm a woman, but unfortunately I didn't speak a Rissen. So, so anyway, somehow we managed to get some sort of interaction with the women farmers, and they, um, and they told me what they wanted, and it was quite interesting, a bit of an eye-opener. They said, well, Dr. Sue, what we want 
is a crop that is no more work to harvest. Because we do everything around this place, and we don't want to be doing any more. So it was quite an interesting perspective. Now, the reason we are working so hard with these kind of initiatives is that the projections for food production are, are actually quite, uh, qu quite scary. So we need to get a move on with this sort of project. So this is the FAO's, the, food, the UN's Food and Agriculture Programme's uh, predictions for water scarcity and water stress in 2025. Uh, so uh, blue is good, red is bad, plenty of red, and you see quite a lot of red as per our models in India. And this is the projected impact on food production of a three degree temperature rise by 2050. Now, we're currently struggling and largely failing to stay below a two degree temperature rise. So this is a bit worst case scenario, but it's not beyond the bounds. And you can see that green is good and red is bad. There's not much, unfortunately, uh, green. And in fact, there's an awful lot of red and a lot of it in areas where food scarcity is already quite a problem and where food scarcity can lead to significant political instability. We think things are bad at the moment uh, in the Middle East and with the migration crisis, but when some of this kicks in, uh, we're going to see a lot of refugees, I think. And you'll see again, India isn't, uh, isn't doing too well either. Uh, and this, um, if you really want to, to depress yourself, then get on to uh, the, uh, <laughs> the UN's um, global uh, view data, which is collecting uh, precipitation. They collect all sorts of data, and you can happily play and call up different things. And, but this is the, the so-called precipitation anomaly. And um, this is where they're using satellite data now. So this isn't sort of projecting into the future. This is measuring what's happening now. And they produce these, these maps every few months. Um, I mean, I've just picked out one, and they do vary a lot. There are some, some uh, quarters where it doesn't look too bad, and there are other quarters where it's absolutely awful. But it often looks quite like this. This is the data from January 2015. And this precipitation anomaly is the difference to the long-term average of current precipitation levels. And again, red is bad. They've got their traffic light system really sorted here. Red is bad, sort of orange is kind of in the middle, and green is good, um, um, sort of above average, and red is below average. And again, you can see the same areas come up again and again, and India again. The, the long-term average, the, the amount of precipitation in many of these countries is declining. But it's not just the, the amount, it's the, it's, the, it's, it's the sort of intensity of things. What we're seeing is more extreme weather. So even in the UK, which is looking kind of pleasantly yellow and green here, but um, the, the NFU, the National Farmers Union, say their biggest issue is um, extreme precipitation, either drought deluge, drought deluge, drought deluge, either too dry or too wet. But then farmers are not usually a happy bunch, it has to be said. The, uh, we've got a pub near our village called the Jolly Farmer. I think not. <laughs> So the other issue I want to, to spend some time on now is this dangerous reliance on chemicals. So we're spending a lot of, of time losing our crops to pests. So if we don't try and control pests, weeds, and diseases, we lose about three quarters of our rice, three quarters of our potato yields, and about half our wheat yield. Even using our very best measures, we still lose quite a lot. And current methods of crop protection are actually preventing loss of you know, between 20 and 40% of our food, depending on which crop and how you calculate it. But that's, and that's an important issue. If we can reduce those losses by 1%, we can feed 25 million more people. So we need to get cracking, trying to sort of cut down the amount we lose. But we're not going in the right direction. Because at the moment, most of this is, is, is achieved by, by chemical addition. And uh, apart from it being expensive and uh, uh, environmentally problematic, it's also just not working anymore. So we've lost about three quarters of our current uh, pest control chemicals from, uh, from, from the EU market. And some of that is because they've been banned, because they're so poisonous that they do more harm than good. And some of it is because they've just stopped working. Because, because of resistance has evolved and so on. Now, one of the problems here, of course, is we've bred our crops so much to change them how we want, then uh, uh, they're not as resilient as they were. So I don't know if any of you recognize 
these delightful items. They look very edible and appetizing. Well, they are actually these, which you might recognize a bit more. These are Sainsbury's potatoes, and these are real potatoes. So wild potatoes in the Andes are all knobbly and, and covered in these sort of chemicals. Now, we don't like those very much, so we've bred them out. So our domestic potato is very vulnerable to pests. And, of course, we sort of compensated by it. So we've got this plus this equals this. And, uh, uh, and my idea is that, actually, if we had some of this back in this, we could get rid of this. So the plan is to try and use plants' natural defenses to, to try and resist pests. And the good news is, there is a bit of good news in this talk, the good news is that most of our crops are grasses, and we might have tinkered with them hugely, but we have actually left them alone when it comes to one important trait, and that trait is silicon. Now, silicon is a very abundant element in the soil, um, and plants can take it up. Once it's dissolved, the salicylic acid, it can come into the plant, and some plants, particularly grasses, uh, take up an awful lot of silicon, and rice takes up masses of it. Uh, it can be 10% dry weight of silicon. So that's a lot to accumulate, and what do they do with it? Well, they deposit it in these sort of structures, of phytoliths or in spines, and you can imagine that if you're a herbivore, that isn't particularly nice. I mean, I, you've probably, some of you probably pulled your finger across the surface of a grass leaf and gone, ow, uh, and that's silicon that's cut your fingers to ribbons. So that does exactly the same to insect herbivores, which is quite handy, really. And I'm just going to show you a few um, of, of, of our results around how silicon works as a defense. So um, this is uh, armyworm, a very significant pest of cereals in, in, in Africa. And of course, locusts, we know, uh, are uh, also very significant pests. And we've got five different grass species here, um, Poelolium, Festuca ravina, um, and uh, Agrostis and Brachypodium. And uh, we grew the plants uh, in low silica or high silica soils and looked at, at how much silica they accumulated and what the effect was. And you can see here, the, 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 the take-home message here is that for, for all the species of grass and for both herbivores, the amount of uh, material that the insects ate was much higher on the plants that had low silica uh, compared to the plants that had high silica. So insect herbivores don't like silicon-rich plants very much. They tend to avoid them and don't eat them, except if they're aphids. This is Cetobia noveni, a grain aphid, and it doesn't seem to mind uh, high silica plants. In fact, you can even argue that it prefers them in some cases. Now, we didn't understand that, and it took us another 10 years of research, because we're a bit slow on the uptake, to realize what was going on uh, with these sorts of differences, and I'll explain uh, more in a moment. So the other thing that silicon does is reduce herbivore growth rate. So we're back to our armyworm again and three different uh, grass species. This time we've got Jashamsia, Festuca, and Lolium again. And this time, just to keep you on your toes, the high silica plants are the dark bars. And this is the growth rate of the insects. And you can see that in all three species of grass, the armyworms grow a lot less well when they're um, reared on, on high silica plants. And the reason is that they don't absorb as much nitrogen. Now, Plants have a lot less nitrogen in them than animals, so it's often quite a limiting resource, and animals need nitrogen to make protein. So failure to absorb nitrogen from the plant is really bad news if you're a, an, an insect herbivore. And what seemed to be happening was that on the high silica plants, the, uh, the mandibles were worn down a lot more. So uh, you see these armyworms have quite big heads. It's not to house a a giant brain. Instead, it's to, to, to have big uh, jaws that are cut through tough material. So uh, these are uh, the jaws of insects that have been reared on low silica plants. And the great thing about working on armyworms is that you can rear them under different conditions and then chop their heads off and look at their heads under the microscope. People object if you do that with cuddly herbivores, but nobody cares if you do it with armyworms. 
So no one, no one loves insects, <laughs> well, apart from entomologists, I suppose. And um, so you can see that these are the sort of teeth and the jaws of, these, of, of the insect. But when they've been reared on, on high silica plants, you can see that those teeth have almost disappeared. And this happens in you know, just a couple of days. These insects molt and grow new jaws regularly, but they still suffer in this way. So basically, silicon uh, uh, wears your teeth down. So the cut to the chase. So silicon's a very effective defense. It's deterring feeding. It's reducing nitrogen absorption and growth. Uh, and it's probably because it's so abrasive. And in fact, when we actually try and measure abrasion by looking at how deep a groove in a perspex plate grass surfaces can cut, you can see that, that, that plants with a lot of silica in cut deeper grooves. But that's a bit of a simplification because what we noticed was when we looked at the uh, level of silicon in a lot of different grass species and plotted that against abrasiveness, we tended to get quite a good relationship. In ecology, this is actually pretty well a dead straight line. Um, but what we noticed were some sort of outliers from this line. So, for example, what I've picked out here is Festuca ovina and then Festuca rubra. So two plants in the same genus, they have very similar amounts of silica in but Festuca rubra cuts far less deeper grooves in the perspex plate than Festuca ovina. So we instantly got this question, why are some uh, plants more abrasive than others with the same amount of silicon? And the other thing we noticed with silicon is that it's an inducible defense. So in other words, it, plants take up more silicon when they're attacked. So this was uh, one of the experiments we did to show that. And we've got control plants that aren't damaged. We've got plants that are damaged with a pair of scissors, plants that are chomped by locusts, and plants that are chomped by voles. And then we had plants that were damaged just once in those different ways, and plants that were repeatedly damaged and looked at the silica concentration. So two very obvious patterns. One is that plants don't respond very much to a single bout of damage. Taking up silicon is quite energetically expensive and difficult, and once you've taken it up, you can't get rid of it again. So plants don't tend to respond until they've been damaged quite a lot. And the other thing that was noticeable is that mechanical damage did increase silicon content, but nowhere near as much as real damage. So plants can tell whether they're being attacked by um, uh, real herbivores like voles and locusts, or by one of my PhD students with a pair of scissors. But again, the picture was more complex. So this is Dushamsia sespitosa, and the, the right-hand side, you all right? Yes, I think that's right. Uh, are clip plants. So we see with Dushamsia that generally you get uh, a, a, an increase in silica when they're damaged. So that is a quite a responsive species. But this species, Avanella, doesn't take much notice of damage in terms of silicon induction. So there are differences between species, but there are differences within species. So you'll see these are different genotypes of, of the Duchampsia, and you see sometimes you get a little increase, sometimes you get a big increase, sometimes not a very much of an increase. And even here, uh, generally you don't get an increase, but there's one genotype here that, that, that makes an effort and increases its silicon on damage, uh, and uh, there's one genotype that makes the reverse effort and decreases its silicon. So there's a lot of variation going on. So there must be something about how plants take up silicon that is quite complicated and, and, and variable. And indeed, it has proved quite difficult to understand the process of silicon uptake in plants, although people have spent many years trying. So this is the state of play, as far as we know it, in rice, which has been the best studied. And there's a transporter in the root of rice, and indeed, in, we've identified it in many other plants now, called LSI1, and that takes up silicon in the transpiration stream, so silicon dissolved in the water, and that's a passive process, it doesn't need energy. But to get this silicon across the root tissues, uh, it does need energy. It needs uh, uh, an active transporter called LSI2, that's the energetically expensive bit, and then somehow or other, uh, the silicon goes into the xylem. We don't quite know how that happens. Then it goes zooming up the xylem, and it's taken out of the xylem by this transporter called LSI6. Uh, I don't quite know what happened to 3, 4, and 5, 
Four has recently been rediscovered, and there was a paper about transporter number four uh, just, la just a few months ago. Uh, but anyway, three and five are still missing. Um, and we don't know then what happens. We don't know how it then it gets sort of deposited on the plant tissues. What we do know is that plant tissue surfaces look very, very different. So they can look very smooth like this, the Stuka rubra under the scanning EM, and this is the Shamsia sespitosa. Now, you don't have to be a genius to think, well, if I was an insect, I'd probably be heading for this, not this. But how does silica relate to all that? Well, what we did was uh, do an experiment where we looked at um, three species, the Stuka rubra, uh, the Stuka rubra, and the Sumptia sespitosa. Now, remember, those were the two Stuka species that differed a lot in their abrasion, although they had similar amounts of silicon. And we had control plants, plants that we damaged, plants that we gave additional silicon to in the soil, and both. And then we analyzed the silicon uh, with a method that we developed at York that, that's, that's much easier than previous methods using portable X-ray fluorescence. And then if you connect uh, a scanning EM to a different kind of X-ray uh, measuring machine, you can actually see where the silicon is located on the surface. And that proved to be a really important development for us. So here are our three species and our different treatments. So these are what the plants look like when we hadn't done anything to them. This is their natural state. So you'll see Duchampsia with its big spines, uh, lethal looking spines, and the yellow color is silicon. So you can see that the spines are particularly silicon rich, very hard, very sharp, very abrasive. Now, Festuca rubra just puts its silicon all over the surface in a nice smooth coat. A few little nobbles, but nothing very impressive. And for Stuka ovina, looks like it's got measles. All the silicon is in these hard, abrasive little nobbles. So you can imagine they project from the surface, and they are going to be much more abrasive than this surface. And we also see when we add more silica, or indeed when we add more, when we add damage, it's pretty similar, that uh, the response into Shamsia is quite dramatic. It then coats its whole surface with silicon and it puts more silicon in its spines, and it produces a lot more spines, and it produces these little knobbly things as well. So this is a plant that knows how to fight back. Um, the Stuka rubra doesn't do very much. It, you know, it has a few more little knobbles, but not really much changes. But the Stuka rubina, again, is very, very responsive and puts a lot more uh, silica down on the surface and also starts to produce these weird-looking spines, which it doesn't have unless it's damaged or has high silicon supply. So you see instantly here that plant species differ a lot in, in, in their sort of response to different uh, treatments, whether that's damage or additional silicon. And some plants respond to that additional silicon by deploying their defenses much more effectively and by changing what they do, and some are a lot less responsive. So we began to understand why if you're an aphid uh, and you can avoid some of these uh, nobbles, you might not be too worried by additional silicon. But for leaf chewers, foliar feeders, that's pretty serious. So it's not how much silicon you've got, it's what you do with it. So in actual fact, when we looked at the actual silicon concentrations, they were pretty similar between Avina and Rubra. But these plants chose to do completely different things with the silicon they took up. And that explains uh, the differences in mandible wear. So this is Festuca avina on very low silicon concentrations having exactly the same amount of mandible wear as a different species with much higher silicon levels. So it isn't about how much silicon you can take up, it's how you deploy it. So we found that damage and silicon supply affect silicon content, but there's very different strategies. So you could say that Vestuca rovina was a more effective user of silicon. But what we really need to do is get to grips with why plants show these differences. What's the mechanism by which plants can respond so differently to the addition of silica in terms of how they deploy it? And we have a new project with DLF trifolium, like that motto, seeds and science. Um, and they're the world's biggest grass breeders, and they have uh, some... Uh, varieties of, uh, of tall fescue that they want us to characterize in terms of, of silicon. And they, they have bred hundreds and hundreds of different lines. 
And they classify these lines according, according to their texture. And they have, it's really quite incredible, they have harsh lines, very harsh lines, semi-harsh lines, soft lines, very, very soft lines, or just very soft lines. And we wondered how they sort of arrived at these sort of demarcations. And apparently, it's by getting their growers uh, and the, uh, to, to walk through the greenhouses, running their fingers across the leaf surface, and deciding if it felt soft, very soft, semi-soft, or semi-harsh. So we thought we could possibly be a little bit more quantitative than that for them. So we decided to take a look at some of these lines. So this is a harsh variety, and this is a soft variety under the, the scanning EM, and you can see these are just various different shots at different magnifications. All the spines and sharp projections um, that there are on the harsh variety, uh, rather fewer, in fact, almost non-existent in some places on the soft variety. So the harsh variety has many more spines, it has many more um, projections so it's much more abrasive so that's why it feels harsher and in fact when we did the um, uh, use the XRF to, to, to look at this these are all very very silicon rich so so the harsh variety deposits a lot more silicon in these structures it not only has more structures but they're very silicon rich but then we found quite I say, say we my PhD student found something very very interesting when she started to look at the so-called efficiency of silicon uptake in these varieties so here's our very soft <laughs> Soft, very soft, uh, semi-soft, semi-harsh and harsh. And uh, I thought the colour scheme was her idea, actually, but anyway. Um, and this is the leaf silicon, but expressed as the amount of root the plant has. So it's a kind of measure of efficiency, because if you have a massive root system, you can take up more silicon than if you have a small root system. But if you look at how a set amount of root takes up silicon, you saw quite an interesting pattern. So the harsh varieties are much much more efficient. So the same amount of root in a harsh variety takes up a lot more silicon than the same amount of root tissue in a soft. So there's something going on in the roots. What is it? Well, fortunately, we kind of might know what it is uh, in that in rice, you see the same sort of thing. This is two varieties of rice, Niffenbauer and Kasselhoff, and you see that one of them takes up silicon much more rapidly into higher levels than the other. And the reason is that the high silicon uptaker has a higher expression of the LSI1 transporter. So what my student is now doing is, is looking to see if we can see that kind of elevated expression in the roots of these harsh varieties. So if it's happening in grasses as well as in, in fescue as well as in rice. Slightly trickier with fescue because the genome is a nightmare. It's not properly uh, assembled or sequenced or anything and the things are triffied with gazillion chromosomes and things. And um, it's so far, she's spent 40 days of high-performance computing power to get one kind of genome assembly. So she's driven to distraction, so it's proven a lot more difficult. I might suggest we work on rice, but anyway. But the reason that this is interesting and why we want to know about these transporters, because, of course, if we can manipulate the density of transporters or the ac uh, the activity of these transporters, either by transgenic means, which is what Ma has done in, in Japan, or by conventional breeding, which we could easily do, because we have such a difference in the efficiency of uptake among varieties, we can simply select for that by conventional breeding. Then we can choose um, varieties that take up a lot of silicon compared to, this is a mutant line that has no LSI transporter, it can't take up silicon, its yield is very low, and it gets attacked by these pests. So the idea is that by understanding more about these uptake mechanisms, we can, we can identify ways to breed for them uh, in, in, in different uh, crops and grasses. But of course, this only works if our crops still have silicon defenses. So uh, this is an experiment we, we did with barley, the, exactly the same sort of design as I've already showed you with the grasses, with damaged and undamaged plants and the and the uh, silicon addition, but this time we did a slightly different uh, analysis, uh, including some cross sections of the tissue so we could see what was going on inside. And the good news is that barley is quite good at uh, silicon defenses. And uh, here, this is why we don't eat the leaves, isn't it? Here's the, uh, the silicon rich spines along the surface. If you do a cross section, you can see the spine very silicon rich and lots of silicon in the cell below it. Uh, this is a bit of a close-up, silicon concentrated in the tip of the spine and in the cell below. And in fact, we see some cells that are just completely 
uh, full of silicon. You'd get a right crunch if you bit down into that. And we saw that, uh, that barley could indeed respond. This is undamaged and without silicon addition, and the silica is kind of uh, located uh, just uh, around the spines. Uh, when you uh, damage, you start to see higher levels of silicon, start to see more spines appearing, and uh, we see uh, more silicon deposition. Uh, and when you have both silicon addition and damage, the silicon spreads right across the surface, and there's quite a lot on both sides of the leaves. So our crops haven't lost this ability, but as I mentioned earlier, when we select for them, we might have disabled these defences to some extent. So we were interested to see whether, even though modern varieties can still have silicon defences and show some induction, were ancestral varieties even better? So we looked at early domesticates um, and uh, modern varieties. We don't have any wild species. or we'll have a project that's going to start doing that. Um, so this is a, a modern cultivar called Optic. And this is a, it's not all that ancestral. It's not all that early a domesticate, actually. It's a, it's a land race from about 1700 or something. It's a beer barley. And we looked to see whether they could induce defences to the same degree. And the good news is that they can. We couldn't find any difference between the land race and the modern cultivar in terms of their ability to uh, respond to either silicon addition or damage. And we've just got a paper that w that's coming out in Frontiers in Plant Science that looks at a lot more of these kind of comparisons and does it across a number of different crops, maize, wheat, rice, and barley, and does look at some much more ancestral and long-term changes and produces some general patterns. And the outcome from that paper was very, very encouraging, looking across um, a lot of different domestications, we saw only very, very marginal decline in silicon defences. So it seems that this trait has not been bred out. And there's another reason why that's a very good news, and that is that silicon is not just good against pests, it's also good against diseases. I mentioned pathogens in my title. I haven't got, uh, how am I doing? Oh, no, I haven't got much time to talk about uh, pathogens today, but just to say that silicon... Uh, coats the surface of leaves. This is a Rhabdopsis attacked by powdery mildew, and this is the silicon all around the surface that's deposited in response to that attack. And it's quite hard to see this here, but this is the normal sort of pathogen response, and this is a uh, pathogen response when silicon is available, and this is when silicon isn't available. So silicon can stimulate the, the pathogen response uh, by turning on genes and by increasing the amount of resistance uh, that the plant can show in terms of other chemicals, not just silicon. So it can help actually help prime other defenses in plants. And just as an example of um, uh, a, a project I did with Richard Bellinger in Canada, who's, who's a soya bean man, and he works on, on, on stem and root rot, and uh, quite interested in the effect of silicon. And uh, this is uh, soya bean exposed uh, to Phytophthora without silicon in the growing medium, and this is with silicon in the growing medium. So if you provide silicon and they, these plants can take it up, they're, they're much more resistant to pathogens. And, and Richard has some uh, transgenic uh, soya beans that have been artificially uh, bred. They've got the gene from wheat to take up more silicon. So He's got overexpressed soybeans that can take up more silicon and more disease resistant. And we've just started a project in York looking at wheat where these are mutant lines where the um, LSI1 is overexpressed or underexpressed. So we can then tell uh, what difference that does make to wheat resilience to both drought, salinity stress, and pests. So that's an exciting project just about to start. It's in collaboration with Vietnam and the Philippines this time. So moving to Southeast Asia, but with the same idea of trying to generate more resilient crops. Oh, and this is just, this is my favorite paper. Towards establishing broad spectrum disease resistance in plants, silicon leads the way. Absolutely. Couldn't put it better than myself. So silicon's a great defense. It uh, deters uh, foliar feeding herbivores. It's quite good at uh, pathogens as well. And there's an increasing interest in using this for sustainable uh, pest um, resistance. But I just uh, want to, to spend the last five minutes, literally, the last, oh, 
what was missing from? No, that's because it's, it's not 20 to 5, is it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just want to spend the last literally five minutes um, on talking about the government's response to some of of these issues. And the government has recognised that agriculture has been starved of investment in the UK for many, for many years, and, they've, and that we need innovation in agriculture to address these challenges. So the Royal Society produced Reaping the Benefits report, there's a Feeding the Future report, and the government's own UK strategy for agricultural technologies. And one of my other jobs, <laughs> I do seem to have a lot of hats, uh, is I chair the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Innovation Club. And we are a partnership of academics and industry, and it's an equal partnership. Uh, and we join together, and everyone has an equal voice in funding new initiatives for innovative research. So what we do is unusually, we ask for research applications from universities, but the industry set the challenges, and the industry members on the panel, which I chair, decide which research is going to get funded. And the reason for that is that then we're focused on real world problems that farmers and growers need to solve now. So that's a real innovation. Never mind the technical innovation, just the administrative innovation of that kind of co-design of project is, is really exciting and I'm really enjoying being involved with that, although it's quite a lot of hard work, I have to say. Uh, I did say that I would explain what N8 is. Uh, so the N8 Research Partnership is the eight northern Russell Group research intensive universities. And I can never remember what they all are, so here we are. Newcastle, Lancaster, Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester, Durham, Liverpool, and York. And we've come together to form a, a, a research partnership. And one of the N8's projects, in fact, our biggest project, is N8 AgriFood. And we've set ourselves the challenge of securing uh, sufficient, safe, and nutritious food for all. After breakfast, we don't know what we're going to do. So it's a massive challenge, but across the N8, there are 350 researchers who work in agri-food. We have six different research farms. We have a vet school. We have lots of uh, crop scientists. So we can, across this group, look at every aspect of the food chain, from soil health through to crop genetics, crop production, but right through to things like waste and biorenewables. And pooling our resources like that means that we can harness those different facilities. We've got great crop scientists at, at York. They can then go and trial their ideas in the farm in Leeds. And then if we've got new ideas for livestock nutrition, we can test them out in the vet school at Liverpool. So it's the idea of bringing everybody together to work for, for extra added value. And uh, Hefke have given us 16 million pounds um, to, to do this. We've got uh, 20 research fellows, 10 research chairs, and a massive investment. And each university is putting in a million pounds to this initiative. So we're taking it really seriously. So you never know, we might achieve that uh, ludicrously ambitious aim, or at least some of it. And we've got three themes. Sustainable food production is one of them where we talk about uh, you know, better, resilient um, plants, amongst other things. Uh, we spent quite a lot of the money so far on logos and branding. Your challenge is to identify these particular organisms. I think that's meant to be a chicken. I can't decide if that's a pig or a cow, but either way, it's pretty large compared to that. Either the gates, the gates very small, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, we're also working on supply chains. We're now in global supply chains. When you talk to food production companies, Nestle, Unilever, all the rest of it, they say, we're not interested in the UK. It's a global market. What are you doing to help us understand how our food chains are going to be affected, our supply chains are going to be affected by climate change and so on? And uh, our third um, issue is one that's very close to a number of people's heart, George Osborne and his sugar tax, improved consumption uh, and health. So... Uh, I don't quite know why there's a picture of my kitchen on, on the slide. <laughs> but, but basically, the idea is that we eat, eat less of this sort of stuff. Uh, and, and, and we've got some scientists who specialize in sort of uh, 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 behavior and behavior change. So that's the program. And I'm finishing now with just returning to the challenge. So we're in a situation where the agricultural land per capita is going down. Food demand is going up, particularly for meat, and hence animal feed demand is going up. And we also uh, have increasing demand for biofuel. So each patch of land has to deliver more. And of course, we've got it to deliver more. We've moved from this to this. 
but we've basically increased production through unsustainable ways. We've chucked fertilizer on, we've chucked pesticides on, and we just can't keep doing that. We just don't have the resources, and it's doing too much damage. So what we need now is sustainable intensification. So we manage to keep yields going without adverse impacts. So the idea is that we have a second green revolution, and it's knowledge intensive rather than input intensive. So we think our way out of the problem rather than open a bag of fertilizer and chuck more on. And so we're going to have to be really innovative, really thinking outside the box, to use one of those awful phrases. And what is the farm of the future going to look like? Well, it might look like this. There's huge interest in vertical farming, in urban farming. We're going to have to harness every kind of technology. Um, we might even end up growing a lot of plants inside. So how are we actually going to develop these innovations? But I'm optimistic. Basically, I'm a kind of sunny-tempered kind of guy, and I just think we can do it. But I thought I would end with a really kind of upbeat uh, idea and quote from who else in these hallowed halls uh, but Charles Darwin. And I actually think this says it, says it all for us. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And that's our challenge. Can we respond to change? Can we innovate? Can we think our way out of these challenges? And I think we can. Thank you. <laughs>